Hey guys, welcome back to the Watch With Us channel. So I recently started a new series called Talking Time where I talk to collectors, industry individuals, bloggers, YouTubers, anybody interested in wristwatches who want to have a great conversation about what you do, your hobby, your collecting, your path to watches, or anything you want to talk about. If you're interested in being guests in this series, email me at jk at www.media.com and we'll schedule a time to get on a Zoom call and we'll talk about watches. In this episode, I sat down with a really good friend of mine, Mike Margolis. Mike is an industry legend. He's been in the industry for quite a few years now. He started off as the director of Hublot here in the United States. Then he went on to president of Gerard Perigo, then to the president of Maurice Lacroix. And most recently, a few years back, has started his own company where he imports some fantastic watch brands. Mike is one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, and he's very interesting and has tons of stories about his wristwatch journey. So I hope you enjoy it. Sit back, relax, and uh, let's cut over to that video. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Watch With Us channel. I am here with a uh, industry legend and a very good friend of mine, Michael Margolis. How you doing, Mike? Good morning. How you doing? Doing great. All things considered, living the dream, brother. Thanks. Glad to be here. So I have my uh, I have my New England covered bridge background because I I just need to put out a statement that I am a New Englander. I love where I live and uh, and I'm not going anywhere. So. And you're in Connecticut, correct? I am. I you am. are. Good. Good. So New England strong during this uh, pandemic, right? Yeah, we've been. You know what? We've been staying home and. Uh, it's fine. It's yeah. fine. Well, Zoom uh, seems to be uh, the thing to do these days. I have a, uh, we both have a good buddy of ours who just went to work for Zoom, uh, Mike Pearson. Oh, I didn't know he went to work for Zoom. Yeah. Just Interesting. Zoom went down yesterday during my Sunday school class. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we, had a, we had an aborted, uh, aborted church meeting yesterday. But <laughs> aside from that, I, Zoom's been terrific. I mean, uh, we find we actually get more people coming to class uh, than, you know, if we were in the building and they walked in. So I'll be honest, I'd, I'd, probably, good. I'd probably be more likely to come on Zoom uh, in a Sunday morning than to get out of bed. That's for sure. Yeah. Especially if I was a kid. Yeah. You were yeah. a kid. Come on. Yeah. Okay. Pushing 50, brother. So, uh, so for those of those of those, those of us want, or those of who are watching uh, who don't know you, Mike, um, you you're kind of every watch guy's dream tale career. I think, in my opinion, you didn't start in the watch industry. I didn't. I was uh, over 25 years in the high tech world. Uh, my last job, I was uh, a sales manager for Magellan GPS. So um, super accurate stuff. It was millimeter level um, global positioning systems that we sold to land surveyors, civil engineers, people who measured the earth. But wow. I've been a watch fanatic since high school. Yeah. And um, I started, I guess I kind of started out um, in the late 1990s as a moderator on Time Zone. Um, I found this watch website and was like, wow, there's other watch geeks out there because the internet was young and fresh and, you know, all the watch magazines, if you could find one, they were in Italian or German or whatever. And um, so I found Time Zone, started hanging out there with a bunch of other watch nuts from all over the world, um, became a moderator there. Um, so I, rem I remember you from time zone because i used to i used to linger there a lot I, I didn't contribute a ton um but i used to linger there a ton i used to read a lot because it was a fantastic resource for for watch knowledge right it was all there was just about and it was it was kind of the equivalent to the facebook groups and and the forums today um you you had more knowledge in those spaces than probably within the watch industry right oh yeah yeah and yeah. i remember and then i remember you started another forum within the forum. Yes. Um, so we very early on, they, they did a couple of brand forums. Obviously, they did Rolex and Omega, um, but they started with Blancpain and IWC. Um, the Blancpain moderator was a guy named Mark Kolitz, and he got cancer and died. Oh. Um, and they asked me if I would take over Blancpain, so I did. Um, 
I had a, a good friend here in Connecticut who was a Blanc Pod dealer. So I used to go down there with my uh, Nikon Cool Picks digital camera <laughs> and uh, take pictures and four megapixel. On the, well, maybe I don't even remember. And uh, you know, that's kind of how we started. And through that, I met Jean Claude Beaver because um, he was still the the CEO of Blanc Pod. He was working for the Swatch Group at the time. And this and is this is prior to Hublot. Oh, way prior to Hublot. That was yeah. in uh, Hublot. He started working there in 2004. Right. So this was late 90s. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we met and we'd hang out. He'd come to New York City and I'd go in and meet him for breakfast. And then one day he said to me, um, can you help me organize a collector's dinner? And I was like, yeah, sure. That'd be great. So we did this collector's dinner. I still remember it was at the W Hotel in Times Square. And uh, we had maybe, you know, 20 or 30 watch geeks there. And this was early. This must have been like 98 or 99. And at the end of the night, I mean, they brought all the fire. He had turbions, perpetual calendars and all the good stuff. And at the end of the night, everybody had gone home and it was just him and me hanging out. And he said to me, I have to tell you, this is the best night of my life. And I was like, I mean, okay, it was nice and everything, but (laughs) you know, he said, no, you don't understand. I spent my whole career dealing with importers and distributors and retailers and I never get to meet the people who actually buy my watch. So I always say there's this big fence in the watch industry. You've got the manufacturers on one side and the, the consumers, the, re, uh, the collectors on the other side. And the retailer can kind of go on both sides of the fence. But, well, it's a little different now because brands are selling direct. But it used to be the brand didn't know who their customer was and the customer didn't know anybody at the brand. Right. And so I kind of helped him jump the fence that night. And we, we had a lot of fun. We became friends. And, you know, like I said, we'd get together, whatever, once or twice a year. And then in 2004, uh, maybe five, he called me up and he said, uh, I have great news. I've, uh, I've left the Swatch Group. I've gone to work for Hublot. And I was like, Jean-Claude, Hublot is dead. What are yeah. you what what do you mean you went to work for Hublot? I mean, could you pick? And he says, no, you can't believe it's going to be amazing. I got ideas. We got to get together. So we get together in New York City at the Parker Meridian Hotel. They have a, a burger place there that we went to breakfast. And he drew out for me on a paper napkin. I wish to God I still had it. Uh, the, the whole Big Bang thing. It'd be, it'd be worth so much money if you had that. The, the gold from under the ground and the rubber from above the ground and the big bang infusion. And, and I was like, Jean-Claude, this is awesome. I'll buy that watch. He didn't even have a picture of the watch. Yeah. He was like, yeah, that's great. I'm glad, but I didn't bring you to New York city so that I could sell one watch. It was like, okay, well you did anyway. Yeah. And he said, he said, I want you to start a new blow forum on time zone. Can I, can, like, I'd, yeah, like to give, I'd like to give everybody perspective Could because in the early 90s, I'm sorry, in the early 2000s, I worked at uh, the jewelry store and we were, a big, we were one of the bigger Hublot dealers at the time. Yes. And everybody in the industry, as well as within retail, we knew Hublot was a one trick pony, right? They had a steel case. They did have some gold ones, but they had, it was basically a black dial, blue dial, or silver dial on that thin rubber strap. And it came in a few different sizes. I think they had a chronograph that did nothing. And it was mostly quartz. And it was mostly quartz. And they were absurdly priced. I mean, for what Mm -hmm. they were. And I remember people would buy them, but like you said, it was completely dead. And, uh, And I'll never forget it. At Basel 2004, we had our, our meeting with Hublot. And I was like, oh, you know, I was with my boss. And I said, can I skip this one? You know, I, it's, it's Hublot, you know? <laughs> and uh, no, he's like, no, come on, come on. So I went and we sat down. Our rep was there at the time. And in comes Jean-Claude Bivier. And he gave the presentation from under the ground and from the sky. And boom, and he did the whole thing. And when we left there, I think for at least 10 minutes, Hublot was my favorite brand that had ever existed. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's so funny. He's like, uh, 
I, I always describe, he's like the Pied Piper of Hamelin, right? Uh. And the first time you meet him, you'll never forget it. Yep. And when you're done with that meeting, you say, I don't know where that guy's going, but I'm going to follow him because this is going to be amazing. To this day, if I, and I mean this wholeheartedly, if I ever feel like I'm losing excitement or inspiration for watches in the industry, I look up some of his speeches on YouTube or some of his videos yeah. or interviews because yeah. the guy, honest to goodness, I, I met him on two occasions in my life. That was the first one that I met him once afterwards. I believe it was again at Basel. And uh, he, he's one of the guys when people say, who pick anybody to have lunch with. He's certainly on that list because I would love to spend – a yep. day with them just to just to feel that energy yeah cool so, so i'm sorry i interrupted no that's all right so we um he said i want you to start a new blow for him on time zone and i had to get permission from the owners of time zone because they didn't just start a brand forum for a brand that nobody was discussing sure and the the hook was jean claude said i'm gonna come to time zone I'm going to participate in the forum. I'm going to answer people's questions. And again, you now you have the ability for people to jump the fence, right? Because now you can get in touch with the CEO of a big watch brand. And no consumer can do that. Right. I mean, today, again, today you can a little bit better, but you didn't bit. used to be able to. So, you know, that's what we did. And we started, I mean, we didn't have anything but computer generated images when we started and we built a brand form. We built a following. When the watch finally came out, uh, I mean, you couldn't get one. It was like so high demand, so low, low supply. And, you know, we kind of started that way. And then I would, uh, I would go. He actually would invite me to come to Basel. I went to Basel, I think it was 06 and 07. Now, you're still not in the industry yet. No, I was still selling gps for a living yeah um actually yeah i was still selling gps we did a pre basel in 2007 uh at the gramercy park hotel in new york city he would bring all the retailers in and kind of get orders before the fair and um he again at the end of the day he turns to me and he says how's your job and i said i mean my job's fine uh, uh you know, I'm in high tech sales and every year the price of your product drops and every year your sales quota goes up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it doesn't do anything but get harder and harder every year to make the same amount of money. And he said, well, why don't you come work for me? And I was like, okay, I'd like <laughs> that. Yes. So, I, you know, it started very innocently and I, I always tell people, um, because I get asked all the time, well, how do I get into the watch industry? I do too. You know, I'm a financial planner. I love watches. You right. know, uh, I'd rather push watches than than uh, 401ks all day. How do I do that? And and my answer is always the same. I, I I got lucky. It's a very closed industry. You don't just get in. Um, but find a brand you love. Uh, start hanging around them as much as you can and offer them some kind of service. And, you know, I worked, I worked for and with Jean-Claude for free for, I don't know what, three or four years before he, more if we count the Blanc Pond days, before he ever said to me, hey, this is good. Why don't you come work for me? Yeah. So it's, I, I got lucky as well. I mean, you know, I met Stephen Butler and, you know, I liked watches and he, he liked me and, you know, I was in I was in high tech as well. I was a project manager for a, for a computer telephony integration company, and uh, and people ask me, it's like, well, gee, I'm the wrong guy to ask for that advice, sort of, because I kind of yeah. fell into it. I mean, yeah. there are paths into the industry for sure. I mean, I think the most logical one is work retail first, and then get to meet everybody and be involved. And uh, I mean, that's kind of the most common route, but. But yeah, it's it's a great story, Mike, and and it's it is an uncommon story. And and what's really cool is that you you weren't looking for that. You you were enjoying your hobby and enjoying your passion, and the hard work and I guess the the good stuff that you had done shone through so so brightly that the man himself was like, hey, you know, I need this guy, and that's pretty cool. I think. I think passion gets you a long way in this world. I agree. And uh, we've all met a lot of salespeople who have no passion for their yeah. product. 
They could be selling whatever they're selling. They could be selling anything else and it wouldn't really matter. Yeah. And like I said, I've been a watch nut since high school and I just, I wake up every morning. I can't believe that people pay me to play with watches every day. And, and, you know, and the other thing is too, they pay you they, and I get paid to, to talk about watches, to be around watch people, which is fantastic. I mean, you know, I said, I said in the video that I just did a day or two ago with uh, somebody else, another interview that um, watches, although I love them and they're my passion, my favorite part of this industry are the friends I've made. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, every industry is like that. It's a, it's a product business, but it's a people business. Yeah. And, um, I just saw, I, great I saw an obituary this morning. One of the, Bob, one of the guys died. Yeah. It's really yeah. Sad. That's really sad. It is sad. I'm, you know, uh, Bob Siragusa, you know, the guy's been in the industry since what the eighties, Bob was one of those guys that you'll just, I mean, I will never, if I haven't, I haven't spoken to Bob in probably 15 years, but if, if he had called this morning, I would have knew who it was right away. And I would have had, a, I would have been excited to speak to him. Yeah, um, exactly. So exactly. yeah, rest in peace, Bob. And, and my heart goes out to the family. And uh, yeah. yeah, that was tough to see this morning. I saw the same thing. One of the first things I saw when I opened up, uh, you know, yep. my, my phone. Yep. Yeah. All right. So Shame. where, where from Hublot? Cause you spent a fair amount of time there. You were, you, you were running Hublot in the United States during the big bang and, and, and the, the meteor, you know, meteoric launch that, that, product had on that brand yeah it was it was uh it was a wild time um uh i was a direct report of jean-claude so um you know when i had to talk to my boss you talked to the I boss to. that's who <laughs> i talked to um and i yeah let's see i ran Hublot 2008 9 10 11 i think that's right um and yeah it was you know it was you'd get 20 watches in a shipment and you had 50 retailers going, give me, give me, give me that watch. I need that watch. I got a pre-sold run. Right. Can I get another one? Um, so it was sort of allocating, you know, where do we send the product? Um, closing retailers who didn't really understand the big bang. They liked the old Hublot. Uh, trying to open up quality retailers uh, you know, that would lend prestige to the brand. Um, so it was an interesting time. I learned a lot. I went through the stock market crash in 2008. Um, that was interesting. Yeah. And, um, and I, and I learned a lot. Um, but I was really just the sales director for much of the time. We didn't have a president. So I was kind of functioning as one. We had a, a CFO that was sort of running the finance side and I was running the sales side. Um, and then uh, Basel World, no, uh, Geneva 2012, um, I was offered a job to run Gerard Perigo North America and yeah. Jean Richard as well. So that was a big jump for me because it wasn't just sales. This was everything, right? It was finance and human resources. We got sued while I was there. I mean, <laughs> I, but I learned so much. It was amazing. It was, you know, how do we import? Uh, how do we distribute? It was so much more than just, you got 20 watches. Who are you going to send them to? Let's open dealers and close dealers. Yeah, not, not to trivialize your time at Hublot, but it wasn't, you weren't, you weren't navigating how to make a successful brand because the product that kind of did that for you. It With did. G, GP was quite a different story, I'm sure. I mean, I'll GP be the first was the to... opposite. It yeah. was the opposite because it was a, it was, a, I don't, don't mean to interrupt you. It no. was, it was dead. It was basically dead. You know, it was a really nice product, really nice product yeah. that had no respect in the watch world because that respect for the watch, Correct. but they didn't have respect for the brand because well, it had been treated so poorly. You know, most brands you learn if you can make, 20 if you can sell 20 of them make 19 yes right yeah. and and gp i'm sorry to say this well if we can sell 20 we'll make 29 instead right and i think so, i think that's a huge problem with the industry as a whole for for the most part there's so many brands out there they're over manufacturer they you know they 
they, I don't know. But the point being is that I was, at the same time, I was a Hublot dealer and experienced sort of the, the beginning of that. We were also a GP dealer. And GP, I will say, hands down, have some of the finest, nicest watches Absolutely. on the planet. Absolutely. And you, it was so difficult because they made so many compared to what the demand was, is that they had to liquidate them, right? Or yeah, yeah. they had they had to make ends meet. So, so when I would try to sell a, a, a Gerard Perigo that was maybe fifteen thousand dollars, people would come in and say, "Well, I can get it, you know, for nine thousand on Forty Seventh Street." You know, yep. it was tough. Yep, it was. Uh, it was a, again a, a huge learning experience. I love my time there. Yeah, um, I learned a lot. We did a, a lot of really interesting things. Like when I got there, they were subbing out all the repairs. Um, they had no in-house repair. Every single thing went to an off-site watchmaker who didn't work for a GP. Wow. Yep. That's so, that's very uncommon. Well, it happened because, you know, they, I don't know, some, some CEO 20 years ago decided, you know, we're spending a fortune having these watchmakers sitting around. Um, so yeah, that's what they did. And so I changed that. We brought it in-house. We built a watchmaking studio in the office, brought one watchmaker from Switzerland, hired an American one. I mean, it was everything. It was buying the tools, sure. setting apart a dirty room for polishing and a clean room. I mean, it was really, really interesting stuff. It was a lot of fun. So yeah. a, lot of good, a lot of good experiences there. We had a boutique on Madison Avenue. I was just going to ask you about that because you and I spoke off camera about this. What, what was the rent in, in New York City and how big was the boutique? The boutique, uh, I'll use round figures. The boutique was less than a thousand square feet and the rent was six figures a month. That's and that was just, that was just rent. Not that included. wasn't, that wasn't employees. That wasn't cost of goods, security. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy. Cause I'd always wondered when I walked down Madison Avenue or fifth Avenue, and I see these beautiful boutiques, albeit small, they're beautiful. And I always wondered, gee, they, what are they paying in rent? You know? And I, I mentioned to you, I, I've got 1200 square feet out here on Long Island and I'm, I'm just barely over a thousand dollars a month. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, you couldn't, you couldn't do a desk for a thousand bucks a month on Madison that, Avenue. That's crazy. So it was, it was interesting. Um, when I started with GP in 2008, um, John Claude said to me, we didn't have a boutique in New York City. And he said, I want to start a boutique in New York City. So I went to, I think it was Douglas Ellison or one of those uh, um, commercial real estate guys. And we kind of walked the whole city. And in the entire five boroughs of Manhattan, I decided that I wanted to be on Madison Avenue between 62nd and 64th. That's where Hermes is. Uh, the Chopard Boutique was there. Right. I mean, really kind of that was the epicenter of watchmaking in New York City, unless you want to be on 5th. But on 5th, the boutiques are huge. And then you're, you're, you could be seven figures a month. Yeah. And, and, um, and when you see these big, huge boutiques and then you see a thousand square foot boutique, you know, you don't almost walk past, you yeah. know, just because you wouldn't notice it. Yeah. So, um, you know, we sit down with the real estate agent and, and, and I came back to Jean-Claude and I went, you know, I'm a numbers guy. Right. And I just, I can't make this work, Jean-Claude. I mean, you know, we're going to be spending, you know, whatever it was, 2 million a year uh, on a boutique and I don't know that we can sell, even a on fire brand, I don't know that we can sell enough watches to make a business a business out of this boutique. Sure. And and he laughed at me and he said, How much would a billboard on Madison Avenue cost? Let's say twenty feet wide and ten feet high. And I said, I mean, first off, there are no billboards on Madison Avenue, but right. I, I can't imagine how much it would cost to have a billboard on Madison Avenue, probably a hundred thousand a month or something like that. And he said to me, now let's take that billboard and put a door on it. <laughs> and you can walk, you can walk inside and see stuff and buy stuff. And I, and I went, okay, so if it's an advertising expense, I get it. That makes sense. Sure. We'll sell, you know, 
But if it's an advertising expense, then I can understand it. But as a pure business, yeah, like if you look at someplace like the Nike boutique on 57th, right? That must be the largest retail space in New York City. Yeah, maybe that maybe that Toys R Us in Times Square, but but it's got to be the largest retail space in New York City. Those guys must be paying ten million a month. They have to be. They have to be. How many sneakers can you sell? Right. How many sneakers can you sell? Can right. you sell ten million a month just to cover your rent? So uh, you know it, it's very interesting. Um, but anyway. Yeah. yeah, no, that's, and that just goes to show you the, the mind of Jean-Claude Biver versus, you know, a guy like me, who's a business guy, I, I would say the same thing. I'd say, I can't make money doing this, but, but he doesn't think of it in those terms. He thinks of it as, this is our advertisement and then people can come in and buy. And even if we lost, you know, 2 million a year or whatever it may be, you know, that's counted as advertising money. Right. And now yeah, they have boutiques all over the, all over the world because they're, their sales model is very much a direct sales model now. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah, now I want to, I want, I, I'd love to discuss what you're doing now because in the world of watches, one of my favorite segments is where you make your home now. And uh, tell us, tell us about what you're doing. So when I left GP, um, which was not particularly my choice, but when I left GP, um, I started a, my own company and I distribute small independent watch brands that, you know, they may like one of the brands that I distribute is Chopek. Last year they made 150 watches worldwide. Right. So how many do you bring into the U S 30, let's say 25, right. 30, 35, 50, maybe even, well, you can't afford a full-time salesperson or you can't justify a full-time salesperson for, 20, 30, 40, 50 watches a year. So they hire my company. I do everything from advertising, distribution. I take care of repairs, uh, importing crocodile straps, all every, everything that there has to do with doing a business in the U S yeah, my company does it. So they hire me. I do distribution, set up a retail network. Um, so I do that for uh, about, four or five small watch brands. I work with H Moser, right. which is the, the largest of my brands. And one of my favorite brands on the planet. It is a really fun brand, um, great product, uh, cool people, interesting marketing vibe, uh, very different watch from the typical watch that you see when you walk into a, a big, box, big box watch store. Yeah, uh, and, and Edward Milan must be a lot of fun to work with. He's a very smart, very interesting guy. Yeah. 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 Um, I tell people, I mean, yes, he grew up in the industry. Yes. His father was the CEO of Audemars Piguet for 20 years, but Edward has an MBA from Wharton. So yeah. he's got an Ivy league MBA. He's a very smart guy, uh, very focused, very driven. Um, and he does a really good job. The product is terrific. Um, yeah, I don't have a bad word to say about it. I also feel like he, um, he likes to think outside of the box. I know he did a bunch of spoof campaigns uh, for their YouTube channel. Um, you know, I just, I, I feel like he's, he's one of the guys that almost like Bivera that I would almost follow because, you know, if, if just because I see that the way he thinks is much different than the traditional industry. So that, that just must be fun. What other brands do you carry? I have Oatlance, H-A-U-T-L-E-N-C-E. Oatlance is a sister brand of Moser owned by the same uh, family, the same holding group. Um, very avant-garde, crazy stuff, uh, rotating spheres, uh, double retrogrades, uh, jumping chains, really fun, interesting, off-the-wall stuff. Yeah. Sort of... Uh, uh, the max booster of the watch world before max. Right. Um, you know, not round with three hands. Right. Let's say it that way. Yeah. And very, very fun to watch in action and to hold and look at and, you know, almost, yep. almost the kind of watch that you don't even need to wear. If you own one, you just, just look at it and, you know, play with it. Yep. Yep. Very, very cool. avant-garde, very crazy stuff. Um, I work with singer reimagined okay. uh, the, uh, the Porsche, 
uh, Porsche guys, uh, Rob Dixon Dickinson. Yep. Um, they're uh, uh, vintage Porsche restorers out in California, like million dollar cars. Yeah. Um, and uh, through a guy named Marco Boricino, who was the uh, CEO of Panerai a long, long time ago, um, they've created a watch brand, which is a very automobile uh, themed cool chronograph really fun stuff right um again i don't know what their production is maybe 100 pieces a year or something like that i was going to ask you i was gonna, they, they've got to be a very small production run as well it is it yeah. is um but really nice product very interesting you know i see the the poster behind you most watch guys are car guys it's true most car guys are watch guys i happen to be one of those people who doesn't cross that border okay but, um but a, an automotive themed watch generally speaking does well if it has a, a nice hook for that yeah so thing. i i'm i'm a car guy in uh in spirit but not in practice because i just can't afford the cars i want <laughs> um but yeah I, I agree that's cool and it is um all of the brands you work with now do they sell direct do they sell through you do they sell through retailers um it's it's all a retail network okay. um if yeah, it, it, it's a retail network. That's kind of the business model. Um, Moser just started an e-commerce platform, uh, like when the COVID thing started. Sure. Um, so that's very new. Again, um, uh, again, just attributing to to Ed Melani. Just he's he's thinking, he's thinking, he's working, he's making it happen. Right, where a lot of a lot of brands are just sitting around waiting for their stores to open. Look, uh, yeah, let's say the middle of March, uh, every single one of my retailers uh, and, and the territory I cover is U.S., Canada, Caribbean, Mexico. Um, I speak Spanish, so, you know, I'll take care of Latin America. Yeah. Uh, and in all that territory, there was not one jewelry store that was open. So okay. how, that was, that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, how do you find, I mean, because I'm assuming that still most of them are probably still closed or operating on a very uh, smaller level. Um, are your retailers selling online? Are they reaching out to clients and doing meetings? Is, is there something that they're doing to keep it going? So I would say every retailer is different. Um, I have some who literally locked the door and okay. said, see you when we're open, you know. Um, and then I have some that uh, had a little e-commerce site going on for you know, whatever it was, maybe they're G-Shocks or, you know, some of the, the um, cool but less expensive product. Yeah. Um, and they were able to easily say, okay, you know what? We're going to put uh, our higher end pieces into the shopping cart as well. Why not? Um, a lot of it is word of mouth where the customer calls up and says, I know you guys aren't open, but can you get me one of these? Um, I've been drop shipping for my retailers. Right. Um, which... I don't mind that. Right. So I actually have two watches about to go out right now. And both of them are drop ships. So one, the customer bought from, uh, uh, from topper jewelers in California, yep. but the customers on the East coast. So it doesn't make any sense to send it to California when the store is not open. And then somehow he gets the watch and sends it back to the East coast. Yeah. Uh, and the other one was an e-commerce sale. So that one's going direct to a guy in, uh, in the Midwest. So That's fantastic. And I, I'm glad you everything, you know, uh, every retailer is figuring out how can I still put some points on the board yes. in this crazy time? Yeah. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm very glad you brought up Topper because when I look at the watch industry as a whole, I left retail almost six years ago, I think um, maybe more or less. Um, and retail, in my opinion, has been very, very traditional. You open the doors at 10 AM, you close them at seven, in between, you hope people walk in, look at something, buy it, and leave. Yeah. Um, and I think that there are a lot of retailers. When I was leaving retail, I almost felt like I was, I was, I don't want to say jumping off a sinking ship, but I was kind of, you know, getting on a different boat while the other one was taking on water slowly is the way I like to, uh, <laughs> you know. And there are a handful of retailers throughout the United States, and Topper is certainly one of them that has – embraced the world of social media, e-com, um, and just various ways to reach out to their, cons their consumers or gain new consumers. Like you mentioned, the one you're shipping for Topper, the sales on the East Coast, correct? 
Mm -hmm. And I'm sure yes. there's I'm sure there's three or four or five retailers in that in your network between that client and Topper. And um, yes, and I just I commend them. I, I like in this industry, I because it is so traditional and so uh, rooted in its ways. I love seeing people do things different. There's uh, there's a handful of stores in the country that are doing similar things. And uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I think um, I mean, way before let's say again, 20 years ago, you had a couple of stores that were good at doing business at a distance. Um, Al Armstrong, Armstrong Rockwell and Hartford is one of them. Fantastic. Um, because he's in a small market yep. and there just aren't that many people that walk in the door every day. So he figured out that, you know, he could build trust from customers that were in Hawaii or California or, or uh, next door in Hartford. And it didn't matter where they were. Um, because with the wire transfer and FedEx, you're going to have your watch the next day anyway. So. Absolutely. And, and it's funny you brought up Al because I've known Al, you know, many, many years, but how I first com had, had come to know Alan about him and his store was through time zone because yeah. he was very, I mean, we're talking yeah. 99, 2000, 2001 before yes. Facebook and before Instagram yeah. and all that stuff, he was extremely yep. active. And I know for a fact that people were buying from all over the country from Al yes. Store in Connecticut. So, yeah, I mean, what I'll say is uh, in, in these difficult times, um, every store is doing things different. You've always had stores that are good at doing business at a distance and you've always had the traditional retail store that opens up the door, waits for somebody to wander in and buy something. And at the end of the day, they, they close the door. And, uh, and today, because the doors are all closed, you've got people that are thriving and you've got people that are not thriving. So. Yeah, I agree. And it's, I, I've had a handful, uh, I'd say two or three uh, good friends who are retailers across the country since this happened, I guess, seeing what I do with watch gauge and say, well, we're shut down. How do I get all my stuff online? And, and I'm kind of like, well, it took me about a year to do it, to build what yeah. I built. I said, yeah. I said, with enough money, we could probably help you get up and running in a month or two if we're lucky. <laughs> yeah, and, um, exactly. And it's going to be very expensive. And it, you know, the guys that you know, they, they didn't plan for a situation like this, but they just planned because the business is evolving. And those are yeah. the guys that are thriving right now. And, uh, and it's, I mean, it's difficult to see the ones who aren't, uh, but on the same token, they sh probably should have been looking toward the future a little, a little more differently uh, for the last decade or so. Yeah. I, uh, we had a tree come down in the, uh, in the yard last week uh, in the windstorm and, uh, I was talking with the tree guy and I said to him, well, when's the best time to plant a tree? And he said, 20 years ago. <laughs> that's I was like, okay. Yeah. That's, that's great. And he, and he said, the second best time to plant a tree is today. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, you've got guys that are visionary. You've got guys that are great at doing what they're doing, but you have to see that the industry is changing. Uh, I mean, 20 years ago, it was unheard of to buy a luxury product over the phone. Yeah. You just, you just didn't do it. Now today, you know, you can buy a car over the phone. Sure. I mean, generally speaking, a car is going to be probably the second largest purchase most people will ever make after their home. And today you don't have to go to the retail unless you want to sit in it and drive it. You know, you don't need to go to the car dealer to buy a car. Yeah. And uh, as much as, as the brands want to, and they're right, want to have a, a luxury buying experience for the customer. Some of our customers are going, you know what? I did all my research. I know all about your watch. I probably know more than the guy on the other side of the counter. Just uh, take my credit card and it'll show up here tomorrow. Right. And I think, um, I mean, certainly what I'm doing is, is on a different, much different level. You know, everything I'm selling is mostly for the, for the most part under $1,500. But, you know, I'm very liberal with the fact that you're buying it sight unseen or at least in person. Uh, you know, if you get it and it doesn't meet your expectations, send it back. I'll take it back. And I think there are retailers who will think that way as well, as long as the watch is coming back as it was received. Sure. You know, sure. And um, yeah, it's, it's certainly really interesting times. Yeah, it's, um, 
the last couple of months have been very different. Um, I've enjoyed it very much. It's, it's weird. I haven't been on a plane since the yeah. first week in March. It's now middle of May. Um, you and know, you, I, mean, I have, you probably travel more than most people I've ever met. I have two and a half million miles on American. <laughs> Never mind all the other airlines. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I travel a lot. Um, yeah. I, I, I love my house and my family, and it's really great to be home. Um, but I'm a little itchy. I'm, I'm sort of half ready to get on a plane and half scared to death to get on a plane sure. at this point. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you get all these people now that are working from home. I have one of my good friends uh, is a big time uh, uh, insurance executive. He's way high up in, I don't know if it's Travelers or Aetna or one of those big companies here in Hartford. And he's like, I never want to go into the office again. I love this, you know? <laughs> I, I and, think one of the things that, that this whole uh, situation is going to do is make people uh, rethink the way they do business. Yeah, I think you'll see office space just as an example, right? You know, we're, uh, whatever, like I said, travelers, they probably have millions of square feet in Hartford sure. or uh, surrounding areas and all over the country. And now they've got people working from their spare bedrooms. Do they need all that space? Right. I don't know. Uh, so I think we'll see, we'll see business in general change an awful lot. And it's probably for the good. I would love to be able to, to Zoom. I've done Zoom presentations on turbions. Uh, it's been very interesting the way we're selling watches today. Sure. It's been a, been a lot of fun. Yeah, very cool. And for if anybody wants to check out your brands, uh, follow you on social, where, where should I direct them? Sure. Um, so on social media, I am the watch enabler. Okay. Um, that's <laughs> great. Uh, I like that. Yeah. J uh, James Lambden gave me that name. James from uh, analog Shift. Yeah. Yeah. We were at uh, watches and wonders in Miami. And uh, I think I was, you know, Mike Margolis or Margolis Mike or whatever it was. And he was like, you're the watch enabler. That should be your, <laughs> I was like, yes, that should be my name. That's great. So I, I changed it that night. So the watch enabler uh, on uh, Instagram and uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, I'm Mike Margolis. Um, and my website is Horology Works. That's okay. in my company, H-O-R-O-L-O-G-Y-W-O-R-K-S.com. Uh, I'm easy to get a hold of. Uh, I answer emails. I pick up the phone. So uh yeah, any way you guys want to get a hold of me, I'm happy to talk. Yeah, so if anybody's interested in a Moser or Alt Lance, uh, remind me again. Chopek. Yep, Chopek. Chopek. And, and Singer Reimagined. And Singer. So if anybody's yeah. interested in those or interested in more information, they can certainly reach out to Mike in any one of those uh, platforms for sure. Yes. And uh, what's next? I mean, are you just, just looking forward to keeping this train running or do you have any other bigger plans or different plans? You know what? I'm, I'm really happy where I'm at right now. I've got uh, a bunch of good brands. Um, I won't say if an amazing brand came along that I, I wouldn't take it, but uh, right now I'm really happy where I'm at and um, we'll see what God has in store tomorrow. Everything could change. But God bless you, brother. I have to tell you, you I, I, I do envy the position you're in because as I mentioned early on in this video, one of my favorite segments of the watch industry are the higher end independents, um, such as the brands that you carry and a few others. So uh, I'm glad to see that you're doing what you're doing. Uh, Thank you. You've been friends for a long time and I, I'm looking forward yeah. to coming up to Connecticut and visiting your, your club. Thank you, that'd be fun. Yeah. And you know what, what I'll say conversely is that you can get a lot of pleasure out of a watch that is three figures. You Absolutely. don't have you don't have to spend uh, ten thousand, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand on a watch. Um, the last watch I bought was a nine hundred dollar watch, and uh, there's just there's just nothing wrong with that. I, I totally disagree. It's that's something we we echo here a lot, uh, or at least particularly me, is that I get as excited about a uh, you know let's see, a $100 Swatch System 51, as yeah. I do about a, a $60,000 Moser. Uh, yep. don't, don't get me wrong, I'd really prefer the Moser over the two, but well. uh, <laughs> but I do, I, I, I agree with you. I just love watches of all ranges, and I know that you do as well. I do. 
John, it's been great. Thank you so much for the invite. Uh, yeah. I wish I could give you a, a real hug, but I give you a virtual one instead. Soon enough, my friend. And also I, at some point in the future, I'd love to have you on to talk about your personal watch collecting journey. You as a watch collector, as opposed from uh, the watch enabler, you know? Yeah, so, that'd be fun. That'd all be right, fun. brother. I'm, Listen, I'm send blessed. Us I got some your, good stuff. Yeah, send the best to your family. Thanks for uh, taking the time to talk with the Watch With Us crew. Guys, uh, check out Mike on all the social platforms. There will be a link in the description below to each one of those. And uh, thanks again, Mike. And make sure you follow this channel. If you don't, make sure you follow Mike. And uh, we appreciate everybody watching along. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks, John. All Good right, to see you. Care. You too, Mike. So I hope you enjoyed that interview with Mike. Again, Mike's a fantastic guy. He works with some fantastic brands. I do appreciate him taking the time to sit and chat with us and tell us about his watch journey. And once again, if you're interested in being a guest on Talking Watches, email me at jk at WWU Media. We'll schedule a day and time and we'll just talk about watches. Don't forget to subscribe to the Watch With Us channel here on YouTube, as well as hit that little bell icon below, which will alert you every time we have a new video posted. And we'll look forward to talking to you very soon. Thanks again, guys.